Station, this is Air Force Staff Sergeant Todd Cavallon. Uh, good evening. Uh, we have you loud and clear on the International Space Station. All right. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, Greetings from Earth, gentlemen, or should I say uh, from beautiful downtown Baghdad. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for letting us be a part of this special event. Uh, having two Army officers on the International Space Station is uh, just great. And um, I, I'm here with a group of your fellow soldiers, and I know they're anxious to, to ask you some questions, so we'll just get right down to it. All right. Questions? Sir. Yes. Uh, Captain John Sorensen, Friends with Texas. Sir, what do you like the most about being an astronaut? We uh, had a difficult time understanding the question, uh, but uh, we recognize that you're assembled there in Baghdad. Uh, we uh, uh, periodically fly over Baghdad. I've taken many uh, pictures of it, and there's not a, a day that goes by when we don't remember the, uh, the service and the sacrifice that so many of you are making uh, over there in the service to our country um, and in the protection of our freedoms that we too often take for granted. Master Sergeant Schroll from uh, Houston, Texas. Also work at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Um, How did you fix your uh, water processing assembly that you had clock filters with? We're going to work on the audio here a little bit. I think that you can hear us just fine. As you probably know, uh, I arrived on the space station the first uh, part of uh, October, launched on September 30th from Kazakhstan, uh, not too far from where you are. And, uh, and Colonel Kramer here launched uh, about a week and a half ago, also from Kazakhstan. Both of us came up on Russian Soyuz vehicles. It takes two days to get here, and uh, we'll be overlapping here on the space station for about two and a half to three months. Uh, Colonel Kramer will remain on board after my Russian uh, crewmate Max Zarayev and I return to Earth in the middle of March. An interesting little tidbit is uh, two or three commander ships down the line will be joined by uh, Colonel Doug Wheelock, a 1982 graduate of, uh, of West Point, which I think is the first time um, that we'll actually have an active duty uh, Army commander on board and taking the high ground as, as best we can. Hello, sir. Lieutenant Kalich, uh, 32nd uh, Infantry Brigade Combat Team, Wisconsin National Guard. Uh, just looking to see if either of you have experienced extravehicular activity and if we can get some first-hand accounts of what that's like. I'm really uh, sorry. Unfortunately, the audio is just not coming through. Um, so I, I know that Houston is working on it right now. Uh, we uh, Let me tell you a little bit about the crew right now. We're a crew of five. Uh, when, with the arrival of Colonel Creamer and his uh, Soyuz crewmates, we became a crew of five. We were a crew of two for a few weeks prior to that, a crew of six. The station uh, crew grew to a crew of six back uh, last summer in June. Uh, uh, by maintaining two Soyuzes here on board, each of them have three seats. That serves as our lifeboat and escape vehicle in case we have to, uh, to leave um, uh, in an emergency situation. Um, and we're getting close to the, the uh, final assembly of the space station. We will complete its assembly in 2010 uh, and uh, transition to full utilization uh, in this international partnership made up of uh, the Russians, the U.S., Japanese, European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. All right, sir, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your holidays? How, you, how have your holidays been? I oh, got that question. How have the holidays been? The holidays been uh, great. Actually, uh, for Max and I, we've been here a while. We're halfway through. Uh, they were a nice, relaxing break to the pace that we uh, have been uh, experiencing since we came on board. Uh, these guys docked uh, two days before Christmas. Uh, they brought uh, or they they arrived bearing gifts. Uh, it was great to see them. Of course, we anticipated their arrival for a long time, and uh, we've had a relaxing schedule uh, pretty much uh, between uh, Christmas and New Year's. And one one of the things that we can can share with you is being away from family and friends at at this time of, of year is is unique for us. Of course, uh, specifically being on the space station. But thinking about you guys, we understand that you are also away from your family and friends and are bonding with the, the troops that you, you are living with, much like what we do here. This is our, our home away from home. Um, you guys, of course, are, are elbow to elbow with your compadres there, and I think that is just absolutely wonderful because that enables us to do what we can do up here, too. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll go back to the master sergeant's question. I think the audio is working now. 
Master Sergeant Schroll from Houston, Texas. I also work at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Uh, How did you fix the clog uh, filter for the water processing assembly up in the space station? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, the water processing assembly, how did we fix? I think you're talking about the urine processing assembly, right? If we fix that, we have not fixed that. Uh, so we're currently collecting urine and storing it as far away from us as we can. And uh, we're having to take the water that we have stored on board in reserve and uh, process that through the water processing facility uh, to drink on board. It's, uh, it's an actually a very interesting aspect of life here. Not a whole lot unlike uh, the field experience that you have there where you have to improvise a little bit and uh, make do with what you have and also uh, get by and operate and uh, live uh, with uh, less than what you otherwise would. And one thing Jeff did not mention is we only have five people on board right now and we have six sleep stations. And one of the storage places for the extra urine is in that sixth sleep station. We just won't tell the next inhabitant that, okay? And by the way, thank you for your service and two counts. Uh, both in the military as well as uh, in the space program. Uh, hi, I'm Tim Donovan from the 32nd Brigade of the Wisconsin National Guard. Wisconsin, the home of Deke Slayton, Jim Lovell, and Mark Lee, among others. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, the Earth will ever be the same to you after, you, after you've seen it from that uh, incredible vantage point. I think for anybody who has seen the Earth from this incredible vantage point, as you describe it, we'll never see the Earth in the same way. You know, when we're on the Earth, we see obviously very limited. In some places, we see uh, just a, a tiny little uh, um, area that um, that we can observe at any given time. For example, I grew up in Wisconsin on a small farm, and I didn't uh, have a whole lot of exposure uh, outside of that, especially in uh, urban environments. And of course, then you get on your first airplane ride, and uh, your whole world changes uh, and when you get on your first spacecraft and you go to orbit of course it changes again to be able to view the entire globe um, looking out the window to orbit the earth every 90 minutes to spend uh, weeks and months here and see the earth go through its seasons uh, it's a it's an incredible place it's uh, it's just a, a fascinating experience to be able to see God's creation from this vantage point I, I can't say it any better than what, what Jeff just shared with you but as we go through our working day, one of the treats is to be able to build up enough time ahead of the schedule that they plan for us so we can just simply go and, and look out the window and take pictures. It is that beautiful. Well, we were broadcasting the event over the radio, and uh, one of our listeners wanted to know what it is like for PT for you guys that far up there in a weightless environment. One of the nice things being in, in the in orbit is that we can lift a lot of weight. I mean, we, we can push around tons of weight up here. So that's kind of cheating. So how do, you, how do you actually lift weights? How do you actually run? And so we have to use other forces the, other than gravity to help us. For instance, when we're lifting weights on our, on our weightlifting machine, it's called the advanced resistive exercise device. We're actually pushing against or pulling against a vacuum that we actually build up in big cylinders. And we can, we can do some serious weightlifting on that device. And uh, running, we have a treadmill, and it's just like any old other treadmill, except we've got these long bungee cords that weigh us down and allow us to make contact and not float away off of the treadmill. And we also have a bicycle. So uh, each day we've, we're, we're supposed to be doing uh, two hours or more of, of exercise. And, and the exercise is not only for our own general fitness, but it's also a countermeasure to, to the atrophy that we suffer when we're up here as well as the bone loss that we suffer up here. Specialist Furler from the 550th Air Support Medical Company at Fort Bragg. Uh, my question is, do you guys ever get the chance to call home to your families? That's a great question, and I know it's a subject that's near to dear to your all's hearts as well because you want to stay in contact with the family. And uh, obviously in the situation that you're in, you're limited to be able to do that. We actually have pretty good resources on board uh, to do that. We have uh, the equivalent of a, of a voice over IP telephone system that go, obviously goes through the communication system we hear, have here on the space station, but we can call uh, anywhere on Earth, and uh, we, we typically call our family every day, once a week or so. Uh, we usually on the weekend, on a Sunday, we have a video teleconference with our family back home. We also have email capability where we can, uh, uh, it's not uh, as quick as it is on the Earth, but uh, we synchronize the email about three times a day, so we're able to stay in contact.
contact that way. And then people send us electronic uh, uh, greetings through video and, and other means as well that we get periodically. So overall, we're able to stay in pretty close contact with our friends and family. Lieutenant Mersinger from Houston, Texas. I noticed both of y'all are wearing two wristwatches. Could you please explain what the second device is for? That's a great question. We, um, you know, the old saying is a man with two watches never knows what, what time it really is. Uh, we actually have a, a real live watch that we use that's synchronized to the GMT time, and, then, and we're living on, uh, on Greenwich Mean Time. But the other black device that we have is an activity watch. It's a, um, it's a light sensor, a photodiode, and a little mini accelerometer. And some of the researchers are, are taking a look at our activity during the day and how active we are versus um, how restful our sleep is. And they watch the, the light and activity cycles to see if we're getting a proper amount of rest, if we get disturbed at night. Um, so they're, they're just, they're tracking our behavior, basically. Uh, Lieutenant Kalich with uh, 32nd Inf Infantry Brigade Combat Team, Wisconsin Army National Guard. Uh, I was just asking if either of you two have experienced EVA and if we could get some first-hand accounts on what that's like. Uh, yeah, I've been outside three times, uh, not during this stay on the space station, but the last time I was up here three and a half years ago, I went out once in a Russian spacesuit and once in a U.S. spacesuit. Uh, and then back in 2000, I went out once uh, on a shuttle flight in a U.S. spacesuit. It's an incredible experience. It's one thing uh, to be able to look out the window here and see the Earth and whatnot. It's another thing to actually go outside. And you yourself in a, in a spacesuit are a spacecraft in itself. It's complete with life support systems, power systems, uh, comm systems, et cetera, to keep you alive um, and functional outside. The work outside is incredibly challenging. Not unlike a lot of what you do, uh, it's a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, you're outside for a, quite a while, usually six and a half hours or, or more. You're in the suit about eight and a half or nine hours. Uh, so it's a long day, but it's a, it's a highlight of the, of the entire experience. Hey there, Sergeant Ron Wiederberg, 318th Public Affairs Office, Operations Center. Um, you know, I noticed you guys kind of look like you're upside down. How does your bodies react to that? Uh, like card your cardiovascular, like do you guys, does the blood rise to your feet or does it rise to your head? Or just stay still? Uh, that's, that's a great question. The, the truth is that there really is no up and down up here because everything's weightless. Um, wh when we first launch on the Russian spacecraft and you go weightless, there's tends to be a, a shift of fluids from the lower legs up into the chest and, and head area, and you tend to see people with moon faces, and, and they get puffy, and all the fluid tends to go in that direction. But, but now, once we've adjusted, um, up and down don't matter to us, and it, and it really doesn't have the blood, fr um, blood flow rush that, that you're referring to. Hey, how are you doing? I'm Captain Sherman, First ID, um, military transition team. Um, we communicate a lot with our military partners uh, on the Iraqi side pretty much every day. Uh, what is it like working with the uh, Russian partners on the uh, space station every day? Uh, what are the challenges? Any funny things happen? Well, the, uh, actually, that's one of the most rewarding aspects of the entire experience as well. Both uh, Colonel Kramer and I have worked with the Russians now uh, for uh, over 10 years. Yeah. Um, or so, and we've spent a lot of time in Russia. The biggest challenge, of course, is learning the language, each other's language, uh, so that you can, uh, as you know very well, uh, develop a relationship of trust. Uh, uh, but uh, we've become um, close friends uh, with many of our Russian colleagues, uh, particularly our crewmates. We do trust each other. Um, the, uh, the, like I said, the language is the toughest part of the whole experience, but once you've uh, got some level of uh, uh, ability at the language, it just opens uh, the doors wide open uh, for those relationships. So we've had a great experience working with the Russians overall, both on an individual level as well as a corporate level. The other thing I'd like to emphasize is that our Russian compadres here on, on station, I can easily count among my, my best friends. The, the humor is really good in both languages. The care, the self-care and the caring for your, your buddy is also extremely good. Um, I, and I have absolutely <clears throat> total faith in, in everything we're doing. The, the interesting background is, you know, I got commissioned in, in 82, and at that time we were still in the Cold War pre-wall coming down, and who had ever thought that we would actually be flying on a, on a Russian vehicle together as, you know, 
equal partners um, with their extreme experience in space and, and, and to some degree, their extreme experience on heavy lifting to space stations in space has been wonderful working with these guys. They're really, really super folks. Major McCray, Florence, South Carolina, the 12th Military Police Command, Fort Meade, Maryland, and the 318th Public Affairs Operations Center. My question is, how did your many years of experience, including military experience, prepared you for what you're currently experiencing in space? Uh, that's a great question. I think that uh, our military experience prepared us for what we're doing in space in the same way that your military experience is preparing you to meet the challenges that you have every day and the challenges that you're going to have in the future. Um, I, I think all of the uh, the things that you appropriate from being in the military are uh, are obvious and those things apply to what we're doing too. The, the uh, 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 teamwork, the dedication to mission, uh, the whole concept of duty, uh, of trustworthiness, uh, 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 of honor, of serving and, and service. All of those things are instilled in those that uh, spend time in the military, and all of those things have a direct application to other aspects of life, and they certainly have a direct application to what we're doing here, uh, perseverance and, uh, and uh, uh, things like that as well. One other aspect I think is, is pretty key is as you go through your your learning curve for the military, one of the things that you become acutely aware of is subjugating the, your personal self for the greater uh, contribution to the team. And I think that's, that's one of the biggest things. We happen to be on the pointy end of the bayonet by flying on the space station, but there's a huge team behind us. Um, and for us to be here is both an honor, but it's also a duty to serve the people who are really operating the space station, which are the, are the ground folks and the researchers. That subjugation is something that is, is really key with my military background and, and I would say most people's. All right, gentlemen, I believe our time has expired. So um, on behalf of myself, the American Forces Network here in Iraq, and uh, all the soldiers here, <laughs> we just want to say uh, good luck to you and Godspeed. Thank you very much. It was an honor to have you on board the International Space Station today. We thank you for your service and, again, uh, for the sacrifices that you're making in the protection of our freedoms uh, that we're able to enjoy. And you are in our thoughts. We appreciate what you are doing for, for our families, our country. Uh, by all means, stay safe and, and uh, can't wait for you guys to get back to your families, too. Godspeed, all. Godspeed, all. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you.